25th of April, 2015, a massive earthquake devastates Nepal. A state of emergency in Nepal, the death toll rises to more than two and a half thousand. Two weeks later, without warning, a second major quake strikes the region. You can actually hear the foundations of the building just kind of rumbling. Lasting just 20 seconds, the first earthquake claims more than 8,000 lives, with twice as many injured and countless missing. I couldn't breathe properly, so I thought I would definitely die. The scale of the devastation takes the population by surprise, but world-leading scientists saw it coming. Nepal is highly, highly prone to earthquakes. The forces were something like a seven megaton bomb. Using shocking footage of the quake caught on camera and with exclusive eyewitness testimonies. This documentary special reveals incredible stories of horror, survival, and rescue. From the city to the world's highest peak, look, look. Whoa. where it's the deadliest day ever. The mountains around us were shaking, the ground was shaking. I really felt that there was a possibility that I die now. And we investigate the struggle to protect us from the next big one. The big question right now is, will there be another one? I work in this field to protect human life and to make sure the level of devastation that we see in these earthquakes doesn't happen again in the future. Kathmandu, Nepal. Saturday, the 25th of April, 2015. Nepal sits between the giant countries of India and China and is home to the mighty Himalayas. Down in the capital, the weekend is underway. <laughs> Visual effects designer Murray Kerr is enjoying his day off. It was a regular Saturday. You know, it was a very, very, very normal, relaxing, peaceful, calm Saturday. A few streets away, student Arati Katawal is on her way to a temple. <laughs> 160 kilometers northeast is the world's highest mountain. Everest. At base camp, over 500 climbers are preparing for an ascent. Among them, 22-year-old German Jost Kobusch. Everything was just normal, chatting, sitting around, exchanging stories. Experienced climber Nick Tolbert is relaxing before his ascent. It was a rest day. Got up, had breakfast, chatted with teammates. I was really excited for this feeling to be out there in the nature. Newly married couple Sam and Alex are heading up the notorious Kumbu Icefall to Camp One, a seven hour climb. I'm just mainly excited about getting to Camp One and, and further. I was just in wonderment going up the icefall. It's so beautiful. You're climbing through a sea of ice. So you have towers of ice, big crevasses, that sort of thing, ladders across crevasses. 220 kilometers to the west, deep under the Himalayan mountains, there's a zone of seismic activity. It's caused by a major fault line over 2,500 kilometers long, running from east to west dividing the great continents of India and Asia. Here, the Earth's crust, made up of tectonic plates, is in a constant state of motion. For over 50 million years, the colliding continents have created these towering peaks. The 
buildup of pressure also causes massive earthquakes across the region. The last large quake hit Nepal in 1934, and experts believe the next one is due. Every 70 years to 100 years, there is one large earthquake. Nepal is highly, highly prone to earthquakes, big earthquakes. We knew that this magnitude eight order earthquake was coming, and we knew that something around this magnitude would hurt a lot of people. We're building up stresses on that fault plane, and eventually what happens in an instant is that gets released. Now, after eight decades of constant compression, these expert predictions are about to come true. Without warning, confused crowds in Kathmandu are hit by violent shaking. Residents and tourists scramble for safety. The first thing you hear is the sound of the glass, like the glass shaking, yeah? Et donc on a eu couru se réfugier dans une petite cour intérieure où il y avait un peu d'espace pour éviter de se faire écraser. Et quand on est revenu à Durban Square, on a vu que tout était cassé. It took everyone by surprise and people flooded out of the shops. The street was filled, people were grabbing each other. The quake has an estimated magnitude of 7.8, equal to the 1906 one that devastated San Francisco. From the epicenter of the quake in the Gorka district, almost 80 kilometers west of Kathmandu, shock waves are radiating out across the continent. Tremors are felt as far south as Kerala in India and deep into southwest China. Throughout the mountains, the quake triggers countless landslides. Twenty kilometers northeast of the epicenter, mountaineers on Everest also feel the tremors. The ground is shaking. What about the ground opened up? Alex and I were in our tent, and the ground starts shaking. But up here, it's not rocks they need to worry about. It's what comes next. Then there's a massive crack from a nearby mountain. And our expedition leader shouted, get out of your tents. It's coming, it's coming. Whoa, 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 it's hot. I was like scared and I turned around and there was this gigantic tsunami made of ice coming towards us. Oh, oh. Across the region, the landscape is about to be changed forever. It's the start of the weekend in Nepal's capital, Kathmandu. Student Arati Katawal is giving blood in the city's Durbar Square. plastic chair, 
जी पुखा बोले दाता तो यह ठहर गये। छह कोठे नानी वो बाबूजी को तोतो तो कहो। On Mount Everest, the climbing season is in full swing. And at least 500 climbers are preparing to scale the world's highest peak. 22-year-old Jost Kobush is filming this footage when he feels the earth moving. The ground is shaking. From nowhere, a massive cloud of snow and ice is hurtling towards them. It, it was a bit like when you're on the highway and you you put your head out of the window. There was no air to catch. All they have for shelter are tents tied down by ice pegs. <laughs> The avalanche outside is traveling at speeds of 300 kilometers per hour, bringing with it tons of snow and rock. It was at least 100 meters high, and it was coming fast. It was one of those rare moments in life where you think, OK, this is going to hit us, and I'm not sure I'm going to get out of this alive. Like, it was suffocating in the snow. 160 kilometers away in Kathmandu, the quake is destroying the city. Arati Katawal is caught in a doorway. Kathmandu resident Murray Kerr and his wife Annie are on the first floor of their house. You can actually hear the foundations of the building just kind of rumbling because the whole building is shaking. We got down the stairs and it was like running on jelly. After the earthquake, very, very quickly, our whole neighborhood congregated in a piece of open space. There was completely blank stairs. Um, my wife was crying. The historic capital of Nepal is left looking like a war zone. Over a thousand people lose their lives, and thousands more are injured. One of the city's iconic landmarks, the Darahara Tower, is among those completely destroyed. In Durbar Square, Arati and her friend are trapped under this collapsed temple. family member like something. Back at Everest, the avalanche has devastated base camp. It's not yet clear who has survived. Stay together. Stay together. Stay together. And we try to find the kitchen head. Oh no, there's no kitchen head left. When we got up, it was a different world. Everything changed. I saw the kitchen tent, which was completely crashed. Everything was covered with ice, and it was just a complete mess. We found generators that were 200 meters out from camp. And the really scary thing was is that all of those items would have gone over the top of our heads. The sea of ice and rock threw Nick Talbot to the ground. In my right lung, I could hardly 
breathe from it and I, every movement that I made, and bear in mind I'm bruised and battered ac across my whole body as well, every movement that I made just felt like agony. Nick is fortunate. 18 climbers have been killed by the avalanche. It's the deadliest day on Everest in history. It's very much a lottery as to who lives and who dies in that situation. And uh, I consider myself extremely lucky to be one of the people that lived. In Kathmandu, as the dust settles, the emergency services respond, but struggle to cope with the extent of the devastation. The city's main hospital is quickly overwhelmed by thousands needing medical attention, while rescue teams begin the frantic task of searching for survivors under collapsed buildings. Arati spends five hours trapped under rubble, when finally, she hears a voice. <laughs> Elsewhere in the city, thousands of people are searching for their loved ones. For Razmila Awal, the quake realizes every mother's worst fear. Her four-month-old baby was sleeping soundly in the upstairs bedroom of this house when it collapsed. <laughs> Neighbors and rescuers search frantically through the rubble. And after 22 hours, baby Sonit is pulled out unharmed. Sonnet's survival seems a miracle. Many others were not so lucky. A state of emergency in Nepal, the death toll rises to more than two and a half thousand. 24 hours after the earthquake, the Nepalese government declares a state of emergency and asks the rest of the world for help. Neighboring country India is the first to respond. Since the magnitude of the problem was very high, we decided to send a very large team from India. The nation rapidly deploys a 13-strong fleet of aircraft with 43 tons of relief. 28 countries join India in the aid mission, including China, the US and UK, Sri Lanka, Poland and Israel. International aid agencies add to the military effort. And over 10,000 tons of food starts to get through to the worst affected. But they face a race against time and the unstable rocks beneath. Within a day, dozens of large aftershocks ripple through the region, causing further damage. The partially damaged buildings were standing there. They could always re-collapse or they can fall down. So that put everyone in fear. That was the challenge for us. While the rescue mission is in full swing in Kathmandu, it becomes clear that many of Nepal's World Heritage buildings have been destroyed. If lessons are to be learned, 
scientists must act fast to gather as much field data as they can on the ground before it's cleared away. Geologist Professor Roger Billum is one of the first on the scene. Gosh, it must have been terrifying with all these bricks falling down, the roofs falling off, the walls falling out into the streets. Horrific. Roger believes the ruins and rubble left in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake can help us predict the next big one. Uh, I mean, it looks like a bomb site. And of course, it is a bomb site. A bomb went off with seven megatons of explosive energy. And this is what happened. He's at the remains of the city's iconic Darahara Tower. Amazing. It was about a 10 second pulse that knocked this building, which was eight stories high. And you can just see the bottom of the first story here. The tower was destroyed in a previous earthquake almost a century ago, but soon rebuilt. You know, this was the thing that grabbed your eye when you landed and, and, and gave your, your bearings as you got, went around the city. Very sad, actually. Despite being almost 80 kilometers away from the earthquake's epicenter, the force was strong enough to knock the 62-meter tower to the ground. It fell in that direction, which is sort of unexpected because the rupture propagated in this general direction. Sometimes you know, chimneys collapse always in the same direction and they sort of lie down and point at the epicenter, but this one didn't. It's going to have to be reconstructed because almost certainly there'll be another earthquake. While Roger attempts to uncover key clues left by the quake, Disaster response teams battle to get aid relief to those living in remote mountain areas, many of whom are completely cut off by the damage. And the whole region is braced for yet more aftershocks. It's five days after the quake struck Nepal. The capital city of Kathmandu is in ruins. Rescue teams almost give up hope of finding anyone else alive. Then, there's a breakthrough. Buried under the foundations of a seven-story hotel, searchers discover a boy. I need a power cord with a metal cutting saws all the way. 15-year-old Pemba Lama is severely injured and dehydrated, but He's alive. As Nepalese and American rescue teams carry the frail boy out of the rubble, the somber mood suddenly lifts. It took four and five hours to take him out. Really, it was too difficult, but we did it. It's all our effort, not only mine, it's all our effort. There's a tearful reunion between Pemba and his sister. Incredibly, under the debris, Pemba found a cloth and squeezed water from it to drink. This saved his life. For some others, there isn't such good news. Arati Katuwal was rescued from under the rubble. But for days after, she had no idea what happened to her friend with her when the quake struck. <laughs> Across the city, at least 1,200 people are killed, most by falling buildings. We see 80% of the casualty is basically is from building collapse. Surya Shrestha is a structural engineer at Nepal's National Society for Earthquake Technology. One of the core areas of NSAID to promote safer building practices. Because um, we see in developing countries like Nepal, buildings or houses that people build themselves are the largest killer. 
We have been working with communities for enhancing their preparedness for earthquake. The problem is many of the structures were hastily constructed multi-story buildings without earthquake resistant reinforcements. Many of the buildings in the region, in Nepal, but around the world as well, are not designed to take the seismic loads. They're designed to take their own weight, so their own mass, which is a vertical force, whereas actually the earthquake imparts both the shaking, but it's a large horizontal force on the structure. So that's the reason why you have collapse. For two decades, Surya and his team have been reinforcing key public buildings to cope with earthquake forces. This retrofitted school was among many of their projects that survived the powerful tremors. Surya and his team are not alone. Globally, engineers are battling to design earthquake-proof buildings. It's a crucial task that could save thousands of lives in seismic hotspots. In March 2011, a magnitude 9 quake struck Japan. Within a few minutes, nearly 400,000 buildings were destroyed and over 15,000 people killed. The challenge for engineers now is to establish which types of buildings can handle a large quake. This is the world's largest full-scale shake table. It's simulating a 7.5 magnitude quake. A seven-story wood-framed condominium escapes with barely a scratch. This test proves that the more lightweight a building, the more impact it can absorb. It will also identify any weak areas in the structure. The results of these experiments allow us to design guidance and retrofit strategies to make our building safer. Good heavens, just look at this. On the ground in Kathmandu, geologist Roger Billam is investigating which types of buildings were destroyed by this quake. We want to know why some buildings survive and one, uh, why, why some don't. For example, this survived a magnitude 7.8 earthquake. We know the last earthquake to seriously damage Kathmandu was back in 1934. It was a magnitude 8 quake, causing widespread devastation in northern India and Nepal. And it raised around a quarter of Kathmandu to the ground, killing over 17,000 people. Buildings similar style and construction and assembly that survived for the last 2,000 years must have survived magnitude 7.8 earthquakes. Absolutely fascinating. This is such a precarious structure. All the weight is above. The pillars are very slender, and yet it didn't fall down. So there's a lesson to be learned there. I doubt whether anybody will build a house like this, but this obviously was able to withstand the, the wobbling of the earth. Knowledge-wise, knowledge exists. We know how to make a rural house earthquake resistant. But the problem is that that knowledge is not reaching to the people. This tragedy makes Surya's work ever more important. And as days go on, the true scale of the crisis becomes clearer. Across Nepal's vast mountainous areas, thousands of people are still without food and medical assistance, and now only reachable by air. As a pilot, see, when we fly in helicopters in the hills, there are no aids which are available, and you have to fly purely visual. There's a lot of turbulence, the clouding builds up, you have to be very careful, this is a challenge. But it's not just tough terrain they have to deal with. They also have the grim task of recovering the dead. We found that there are a lot of casualties which have to be brought in, a lot of injured, a lot of patients on stretchers. These seven trekkers were tragically killed in a landslide. We already brought around seven bodies which were under the landslide. So uh, people are doing their work, everybody is uh, contributing for the relief and the rescue of uh, the three victims. During the earthquake high in the Himalayas, the powerful shaking triggered lethal avalanches. 
like the one that killed 18 people on Everest. But it also generated deadly landslides. North of Kathmandu Valley is Langtang. This trekking destination is at an altitude of 4,000 meters and surrounded by peaks. The earthquake triggered landslides that flattened the village, claiming over 100 lives. I think in this case, the, the most damaging landslide we've heard of so far has been in the Langtang Valley. Geophysicist Dr. Colin Stark has been studying the effects of earthquakes for three decades. Not only was there strong shaking in the valley itself, which probably damaged houses, but there were several, one in particular very large, that wiped out whole villages. He hopes this research could better protect us in the future. Landslides, whatever the cause, are a deadly threat on mountains and hillsides all over the planet. strike, a global network of seismometers gathers the data, allowing scientists to detect which conditions pose the greatest danger. It's very rare to have any scientific grade measurements of very large landslides. So by doing experiments in this context, we can actually simulate those very large events. To examine a landslide up close, Colin uses a giant centrifuge, recreating one in lab conditions. This is our 100G ton centrifuge. It's a three meter arm that can spin up to three times per second, generating 100G forces. The work that we do here is mainly focused on landslides and understanding how far those landslides will go and the damage that they will do when they strike. A landslide of several meters deep and hundreds of meters wide is simulated close to the scale of the landslides that hit during the Nepal earthquake. It may look like some polystyrene balls floating across a screen, but this shows how dry debris flow moves down a canyon, similar to what occurred on Nepal's mountain slopes. By understanding what causes the surface to fail and investigating how the rocks fall, Scientists are better able to predict which towns and villages are most vulnerable, which in turn could save lives anywhere on the planet. When an earthquake like this hits and you see the impact on real people and the effects of processes that we study, it reminds us that what we're doing actually has a tangible benefit. One week after the earthquake struck, the race is on to get relief to the many survivors left homeless. Fear of aftershocks, hunger and thirst are all taking their toll. Emergency workers and military assistants are still clearing debris. While the cleanup effort continues, geologist Roger Billum is investigating the possibility of future threats. And to do that, he studies the surface for evidence of the destructive events beneath. This is pretty spectacular. Now, throughout the city, we have cracked buildings and walls falling down absolutely everywhere. But here, we have the ground itself cracked. This crack actually goes down about four meters. Um, and, and sometimes cracks like this open and um, cows and things fall in and get squashed and you sort of disappear. These cracks might reveal the true force of the earthquake. This is a very spectacular manifestation of a process called um, lateral spreading. And it's caused by the ground moving backwards and forwards with water in it. It's kind of uh, sloppy jello, jelly type ground. What you can see here is the bricks have really picked out what's going on. The contours are caused by the enormous strains in the ground, and this is pretty heavy, okay? Heavy. Now imagine the weight of the entire city of Kathmandu. Now imagine the, the weight of the rocks beneath Kathmandu going down 10 kilometers. All of that, including this brick, 
and anybody standing on the ground here, was raised about 1.5 meters in 30 seconds. It was something like that. And at the same time, the city lurched to the south. And that's what brought down the buildings. And in fact, it's remarkable. It didn't bring more buildings down. Beneath the Himalayas, the squashing of tectonic plates, where India slides under the rest of Asia, has been shaking this landscape for millions of years. The 2015 earthquake was 16 times more powerful than the one that struck Haiti in 2010, equivalent to 500 Hiroshima bombs. Roger believes that, with so much more energy stored under the Himalayas, the Nepal quake could have been much bigger. And that raises a terrible question. Is this catastrophic event random, or is there a deadly pattern of events? The big question right now, and one that is of great concern to the citizens of Kathmandu, is will there be another one? And no one could have known quite how soon the next quake would hit. Nepal is hit by a second major earthquake. The Nepal earthquake on the 25th of April 2015 shocked the world. But in the following days, scientists feared that Nepal's struggles weren't yet over. Professor Tim Wright is unraveling how the quake changed the landscape forever, hoping for clues to what might happen next. I use satellites to measure how the ground deforms to understand what happened in earthquakes. All along the Himalaya fault line, there are other sections of built-up tension which haven't been released for decades. Any of these spring-loaded fault lines could trigger another earthquake. The fault that slipped was about 10, 15 kilometers below the surface. And this entire area, starting at the epicenter in the west and going 150 kilometers to the east, slipped. And it went right underneath Kathmandu. Tim uses a technology called satellite radar interferometry to see how the earthquake has changed Nepal's terrain. The European satellite Sentinel-1A captured a snapshot of Nepal in the days leading up to the quake. And again, just a few days later. Tim used his system to analyze the data and create this contoured representation of the movement that occurred on the fault during the quake on the 25th of April. This is an area that's 250 kilometers wide, covering most of Nepal. The epicenter of the earthquake is here, marked by that red dot. And what we see in these colorful interference patterns is a real map of how the ground has moved during the earthquake. The findings are surprising and worrying. Of particular immediate concern, perhaps, is this region south of the main slipping area, between Kathmandu and the frontal thrust, which doesn't appear to have moved in this earthquake. This earthquake, though deadly to those who lived above it, might only be a precursor to something much bigger. The entire Himalayan chain is being loaded all the time, and that has to be released in a big event. It could be several earthquakes, or it could be one big earthquake. It's a bit like a time bomb, but we don't know the length of the fuse on that time bomb. Just two weeks after the devastating quake, the region's worst nightmare comes true. Nepal is hit by a second major earthquake. Today, the terror returned just two weeks after 8,000 people were killed there. The quake has a magnitude of 7.3, almost as powerful as the first. Its epicenter is 75 kilometers east of the capital Kathmandu, close to Mount Everest. And it kills at least 100 more people. Authorities advise people to stay outside to avoid the deadly threat of building collapse. 
earthquakes are kind of selective about what they want to destroy. They go for the weakest. It's just like evolution. It can be rebuilt and it will be rebuilt better. I mean, that's the good news. This is a great opportunity to make our houses, our infrastructure safe. So we have to look at the opportunity given by this earthquake to rebuild our future safe. Scientists are working on other advances that will enable us to respond quicker to earthquake warnings. I think in the future, technological developments that will help us better assess earthquakes like this will be networks of early warning, smartphone deployed messaging, together with a training of people to know what to do to respond. Smartphone apps are being developed that use information from ground motion sensors to raise the evacuation alarm when an earthquake is about to strike. Early warnings basically give you some time to respond. So if people can have time to escape from the buildings, that would be great and can reduce the amount of damage and uh, casualties. But for those who lived through the events of April and May 2015, they will never forget the enormity of the Earth's destructive power. For some, Nepal is the place where their dreams of ascending the world's highest mountain are realized. But Everest climbers too are still reeling from the shock. I got a second chance. I got a second life. And somehow my, my view on things changed. I have just been on the mountain two years in a row where there have been fatal avalanches. I'm not sure if I could put my family through it again. I thought there was a strong chance I'd die um, because I couldn't see a way out of it. But, you know, there's a lot of luck involved in, in terms of wh whether you live or die in that situation. The resilient Nepalese people are coming to terms with what has happened to their loved ones and their homes. It's, it's, a, it's a very sad time, and the extent of damage is widespread. Arati, who tragically lost her friend in the quake, is starting to plan for the future. <laughs> Despite the extreme circumstances and the fear of even more shocks to come, they are rebuilding their lives. On the 25th of April, 2015, a massive earthquake devastates Nepal. A state of emergency in Nepal, the death toll rises to more than 2,500. Two weeks later, without warning, a second major quake strikes the region. <laughs> You can actually hear the foundations of the building just kind of rumbling. Lasting just 20 seconds, the first earthquake claims more than 8,000 lives, with twice as many injured and countless missing. I couldn't breathe properly, so I thought I would definitely die. The scale of the devastation takes the population by surprise, but world-leading scientists saw it coming. Nepal is highly, highly prone to earthquakes. The forces were something like a seven megaton bomb. Using shocking footage of the quake caught on camera and with exclusive eyewitness testimonies, this documentary special reveals incredible stories of horror, survival and rescue. From the city, to the world's highest peak. 
Look, look. Whoa. Where it's the deadliest Whoa. day ever. Whoa, don't, get down, get down. Oh, my God. The mountains around us were shaking. The ground was shaking. I really felt that there is a possibility that I die now. And we investigate the struggle to protect us from the next big one. The big question right now is, will there be another one? I work in this field to protect human life and to make sure the level of devastation that we see in these earthquakes doesn't happen again in the future. Kathmandu, Nepal, Saturday the 25th of April, 2015. Nepal sits between the giant countries of India and China and is home to the mighty Himalayas. Down in the capital, the weekend is underway. This magnitude would hurt a lot of people. We're building up stresses on that fault plane. And eventually, what happens in an instant is that gets released. Now, after eight decades of constant compression, these expert predictions are about to come true. Without warning, confused crowds in Kathmandu are hit by violent shaking. Residents and tourists scramble for safety. The first thing you hear is the sound of the glass, like the glass shaking, yeah? Et donc on a eu qu'on se réfugier dans une petite cour intérieure où il y avait un peu d'espace pour éviter de se faire écraser. Et quand on est revenu à Durban Square, on a vu que tout était cassé. about getting to camp one and further. I was just in wonderment going up the ice fall. It's so beautiful. You're climbing through a sea of ice. So you have towers of ice, big crevasses, that sort of thing, ladders across crevasses. 220 kilometers to the west, deep under the Himalayan mountains, there's a zone of seismic activity. It's caused by a major fault line over 2,500 kilometers long, running from east to west, dividing the great continents of India and Asia. Here, the Earth's crust, made up of tectonic plates, is in a constant state of motion. For over 50 million years, the colliding continents have created these towering peaks. The buildup of pressure also causes massive earthquakes across the region. The last large quake hit Nepal in 1934, and experts believe the next one is due. Every 70 years to 100 years, there is one large earthquake. Nepal is highly, highly prone to earthquakes, big earthquakes. We knew that this magnitude eight order earthquake was coming, and we knew that something around it. <laughs> Visual effects designer Murray Kerr is enjoying his day off. It was a regular Saturday. You know, it was a very, very, very normal, relaxing, peaceful, calm Saturday. A few streets away, student Arati Katawal is on her way to a temple. <laughs> 160 kilometers northeast is the world's highest mountain. Everest. At base camp, over 500 climbers are preparing for an ascent. Among them, 22-year-old German Jost Kobusch. Everything was just normal, chatting, sitting around, exchanging stories. Experienced climber Nick Tolbert is relaxing before his ascent. It was a rest day. Got up, had breakfast, chatted with teammates. 
I was really excited for this feeling to be out there in the nature. Newly married couple Sam and Alex are heading up the notorious Kumbu Icefall to Camp One, a seven hour climb. We're just mainly excited.